With our second deadline nearly blown and over 500 kilometers to go, Ian still hasn't been paid, so he uses this as leverage and holds the convoy hostage in Kampala. Kind of had to play hardball at one point with the client because uh, they owed us a ton of money for driver's wages, accommodation, and all our expenses. So I had to tell them, listen, we're not going to move any further until we get that money paid in today. And they were a bit uppity on that, but they paid by the end of the day. So we kept moving. Meanwhile, we discovered the reason our pal Mongo's been having problems with fuels because he's been selling it from his tank to the locals along the route for extra cash. Luckily, Ian's able to get Jared back for the remainder of the trip. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. Looks like you've been having some chaos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> good chaos. Glad to join back up with you guys again. This looks like a Jared shows up. It's like here. guy who was, I, I was supposed to spend like the whole time on the road with, <laughs> but hadn't seen him yet in Africa. Mongo gets fired, and as the day wears on, we make repairs to the beater that Jared has inherited. Does it run? So we're all wondering. <laughs> With roughly another 600 kilometers to go, and a week behind schedule, we get some much needed sleep and hit the road at 3 a.m. the next day, on the last stretch for South Sudan. This Toyota truck, I mean, just barrels full speed in the back of race trailer. Thing was flying like a bat out of hell. Out of the middle of nowhere, just full speed ahead, slammed into the back. Oh. That guy's damn lucky to be alive. It's lucky there wasn't any passenger to cut him in half. You are lucky, my friend. I'm lucky. <laughs> You're lucky to be alive. Without the engine. The driver of the truck that hit Ray was drunk. I mean, he, he uh, was stumbling around with the smell of alcohol in his breath. Liquor bottles falling out of his truck. So, uh, you know, we kind of like told the police, hey, you know, this guy's drunk. You know, you might want to do something about it. Like, you know, it's kind of a hazard. We're going to release him huh? for treatment? Yeah, I want him to go for treatment. So he's free to go. The drunken yeah. driver of the guy that hit us you know, is no, going, free car, to go. And you're going to take us to the, to the station. Together with you, but of course, let him go and get him. This guy should, uh, you know, receive a few consequences, you know, for his actions. And uh, they're like, oh, no, 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 you know, we're, we're going to release him for now and we'll investigate it later. Possible. I'd like to have him tested for alcohol now while he's still drunk. The machines are in the, in the office there. Uh-huh. But you, you understand, the longer you wait to test him, the it more sober he becomes. Contest. Yeah? All good machines nowadays, they're very effective. No. They're good. Getting no. drug off to the police station, yeah. and uh, that was a circus. Wow. Sure. You know, we go in there, and um, automatically the police start making up their own version of what happened, even though they weren't even there. We're not really that worried about it, because all throughout the police station, there's like these bundles, huge bundles of uh, police statements. They, they scribble down the statement on this piece of paper and it goes into a stack just around the police station, like old tombs. And uh, there's like an inch of dust sitting on top of all of them. This guy's filled my heart with rage. How are you? Hello. You're walking in the water. No, it's okay. Yes, you did good. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I am being lifted by this. It's okay. <laughs> I think his ears are cold. <laughs> uh -uh. No, no. Okay. 
tell the guy the victory belongs to the Lord and he starts picking me up like I'm his Christ or something. Fortunately, there was like kind of a, a break in the firestorm. Uh, we get the license back and we don't hesitate. We like are out the door, in the trucks and out of there before these guys get a chance to change their mind or come up with anything else. I'm technically in a gray area as far as the court system and what will actually happen to me and what record there is in Uganda of that incident. Paranoid out of my mind from dealing with that accident. Now I'm in heavy traffic. You got guys up here on boat is falling over sideways because they can't keep their shit together. And my truck's like on the verge of like catastrophic failure. It's been one hell of a day. <laughs> TIA. The pressure of being on the road for 50 days is finally getting to me. I'm at, I'm at the verge. Just over the border, we stop for a bite to eat. While assessing both rigs, we find a massive leak. The front axle, it's, it's sprung a pretty hefty leak. We powwow and call Ian to give him an update and options. These trucks, I mean, are, you know, hanging on a thread. I mean, the next thing they're gonna need is a tow truck. We just, last night we put in 10 liters and uh, went 200, 200 kilometers and it was like, it was like it got showered in uh, gear oil under there. I mean, we can keep always adding. It just costs money. Let me let me let me talk it over with the guys um, and get, get their opinion. Get their opinion on that. I mean, we could always get like a drum of oil and just like mount it on top of the trailer, run a hose in there, and just let it slowly feed into the, the dip as we're going down the road. To me, like an IV. Like like an IV. I mean, you know, I, I have heard from uh, sources that bananas are, are uh, no no are, are bananas. Kids. Bananas are uh, a good remedy for jacked up diffs. It works as a grease. How long have you been in Africa, Jerry? Because I think you're turning into an African. <laughs> Stuffing bananas in the differential for <laughs> lubrication. <laughs> you guys thought I was joking. About this banana thing, I'm serious. Like, it really works. Should we go into the market and see, see what the cost is? Yeah. Okay. I'll go, I'll go see what bananas are going for. You know where I can buy bananas? No. No. You're not selling. Oh, okay. Shoot, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty. You only get bananas. Bananas you get in, uh, in town. He's a good guy. All I want is bananas. Can I get all of them? How much? Six pounds. You said they're two pounds each. No. Three pounds each. No, I'll give you two pounds each. One is two pounds. One is two pounds. Yeah. So if there's sixteen, sixteen times two is thirty-two pounds. Why would I give you fifty for thirty-two pounds? You tried to cheat me first. That's your mistake. One pound for one. Okay. Yeah, all of them. I want all of them. So uh, this is it right here. If you get an example, this diff right here um, on this guy's rig. Uh, what happens when uh, your diff starts going out and you don't put bananas in it? This diff is shot. You can see all the teeth are busted off. You know, you don't want to end up like this guy out in the middle of nowhere. Um, this guy's pretty much SOL. So we pulled the axle shaft out, stuffed a bunch in there, put the axle shaft back in, and we're good to go. Chew a calling, my friends. Good old African bush mechanics. Good idea Jared brought up. After a long day of making deals with swindling banana brokers in the hot Sudanese sun, we hop on motorbikes and go for a fishing expedition on the Nile. 
get a move on. That's what I'm going to do. Get the Nile, do some swimming, some fishing. We're down with this. For the most part, countries in Africa, people are pretty friendly, always eager to make friends with you and uh, to be hospitable. <laughs> I, think she, I think she thinks you're going to be lucky if you get one. <laughs> South Sudan's a whole different story. This lady doesn't look happy. Hmm? One just walked up. Yeah? Unhappy? unhappy. Okay. Tell them if we catch the fish, we'll give them. We don't want to keep it. We were told we we were told by the uh, commander in Nimule, the, uh, Arop, Arop, yeah, that it's okay. We can go and and. Uh, but Arop is not the right office. I know, I know, but he's Arop. He's, he's the big Arop man. Arop in a Arop of of it all in a of it. Why left the barrow? They must have left. Why left? I know. We have allies. George Bush was the best friend of your late leader. We understand. <laughs> Before you know it, we're surrounded by a bunch of these dinkas that are like, hey, check out the white boys. Let's see if we can push them around a little and see what we can get from them. They're threatening to kill us, tie us down. So there was a couple AK-47s present, guys telling us that if they wanted to, they could definitely injure us, if not kill us, telling us that we shouldn't be in their country. So, hey, hey, hey! With the situation rapidly deteriorating, I make a call to a Sudanese military friend and it cools down. They finally agree to let us leave. This may be Africa, but it smacks a lot of the, the Wild West, the era of cowboys. And I kind of feel like a cowboy, you know, just riding on, doing my own thing. All right, let's do this. I think this next part of the journey, it's time for me to bring out my spurs kick this buffalo into high gear. It's been a long trip. I've been dealing with grease, dirt, sweat. Not hot showers every night. This is Africa and the load goes forward. We keep moving. One last stop for some Juakali banana bush mechanics and we approach the final stretch of our journey. After nearly two months on the road and more than 5,000 kilometers later, we park the trucks and hand the keys over to the client. It's been 55 days of interesting travel. It's been hell. I don't think there's been any heaven, but it's over now. The final highlight, actually reaching Juba, the final destination. Looks like this is the end of the road for us today. Uh, trucks will be here until they get cleared into Juba. Who knows how long that will take. And then uh, should be free to move back to Kenya today. Pretty excited. My next move is to, to move up to northeastern Kenya n near this refugee camp. There's like a million refugees scrambling for clean water. I mean, the water they do have is like contaminated by animals or sewer or waste. I got a real burden to go up there and help these people that are suffering. After witnessing decades of conflict and crisis in Africa, it's refreshing to me to see a new breed of American workers striking out to find their fortunes in this last wild west. But there's an abundance of land and resources here, and despite a lot of corruption and red tape, a lot of opportunity. It's rough, and there's a lot of bullshit we have to deal with in this kind of business and in the places we operate. But the rewards can be fun and heartbreaking at the same time. In comparison to what little America has to offer young entrepreneurs, with the right kind of determination, there's plenty of adventure and ultimately money for America's new frontiersmen. So yeah, Africa is the last Wild West. It's virgin territory. <laughs>